Okay, everybody, I think we can go ahead and get started. I don't see anybody else coming in at this point, but, um, but hopefully they will. Um, so anyway, welcome to this month's installment of the Iowa OER Action Team's Professional Development Webinar Series. We relaunched this series um, about a month after a COVID hiatus, and we hope to hold these webinars monthly for the remainder of the year. So if you enjoyed today's webinar, make sure you look for our announcements in the ACRL um, Iowa Listserv, the ICCOC newsletter, and um, the Iowa OER Listserv. Um, so if you have any topics of interest that you'd like to see covered in these webinars, if you've um, you know, attended a few of them, you can always send us a message through the Iowa OER Action Team Listserv. And um, I'll also post the link to that um, on the chat as well. Um, I posted the link to our group, but I think it might be helpful too to have the link to the actual listserv. Um, I'd like to put in a plug for that just because we're, we've just launched it and we're just kind of starting to get um, more kind of like activity on that um, on that list. But it's a good one to kind of follow if you're interested in OER, particularly in the state of Iowa. Um, we have lots of, you know, updates about webinars like this, but also we like to share, um, you know, various updates and things on that listserv as well. So, um, so yeah, I encourage you to check that out. Um, my name is Mariah Burnett, and I'm the Scholarly Communications Librarian at the University of Iowa. And today I am joined by Assistant Professor of Economics, Matt Clancy from Iowa State University. And today Matt's going to talk about his experience using the Learn It Fast website to create personalized distributed practice tools for students in an online intermediate microeconomics class and using the free core E I'm sorry, core econ project book for an introductory level microeconomics class. So we'll keep our microphones muted until the question and answer period. But if you have any questions or comments in the meantime, just feel free to type them into the chat. And if any of the questions seem particularly um, timely to what Matt is saying, I might jump in. But um, for the most part, we'll try to kind of keep them um, to the end of the session. So um, the whole session will be recorded. You'll notice that the recording lights on. Um, so we'll record that and then um, share it out after the session. We'll post it to the Iowa OER Action Team's website, um, but you can also find it directly on YouTube too um, at the Iowa OER YouTube channel. So I will now turn off my mic and, or not, yeah, I'll turn off my mic, but also my camera and, um, and turn it over to Matt. All right, thank you. Um, I, Mariah, I think you need to give me the permission to share my screen though, because, uh, Right oh, now, I'm sorry about that. Yes, I do. <laughs> sorry. Okay, okay you can have it now. All right, let's give it a try. So, yeah. So what I wanted to talk about is, um, first off, um, I want to make sure everyone can hear me. Uh, I use this microphone. Sometimes when I use it, everyone says it's, it's, it's you know, it's a real microphone, sound sounds better. But I've had occasionally people say, like, it fades in and out. So if that's happening, please send me a message and I'll, I'll fix it. But anyway, um, so I, I use this uh, free, I want to tell you about this kind of material I'm building using this free uh, program or website called Learn It Fast. And I thought I would start by going over a spiel on sort of uh, what spaced repetition is in distributed practice. This is the taken from the kind of thing I tell my students when I try to tell them why I'm having them use this uh, platform. So anyway, spaced repetition is a simple idea. It's just basically you a way of reviewing where the review is broken up over time. So instead of break, uh, studying for one hour, you might study for 15 minutes one day, 15 minutes a week later, and so on and so forth. And uh, it's really efficient. It's a really efficient way to study in terms of long-term retention of stuff. So you remember a lot better if you do the same amount of work, but you do it in this spaced repetition way. So there's this one study that's like very striking and um, it's probably an outlier, but we'll go to a meta-analysis afterwards to show that it doesn't all depend on this study. But here's this study where they gave people, uh, I think it was six different sessions of review. So maybe each one is 15 minutes. And uh, they basically check to see how does breaking that review session up make a difference. And so, you know, at the top here, we've got zero days between sessions. So this is just back to back to back. This is cramming. So they've studied some topic and then they study it for 90 minutes or, you know, 15 sessions. Maybe there's a break in between them all, but it's all on the same day. And doing that, you bring your, uh, you know, the amount of the stuff they remember correctly up from 80% to 100% after cramming. But then when you test them 30 days later, that's dropped to 65%. 
so they don't remember uh, as much. If you break it up, and so you do just the same amount of total time, but one per day, and then you test them uh, 30 days later, well, it's a lot harder at the outset. They're only remembering 55% one day afterwards, but if they keep coming back to it, uh, they get that up to 100% again, and the retention is much better 30 days later. It's now 85% of the stuff they can recall. Then the last study was they just sort of review once a month. And originally the results are, they kind of plummet, like people can't remember any of this stuff. They get back up to 75 and then they get this very incredible, frankly, I'm like skeptical, this would really even be replicated, but 30 days later, 95% of the stuff these guys can remember correctly. So it's pretty interesting and pretty amazing. And it's not just, I've got my animations wrong here, but anyway, uh, it's not just this one study. There's this big meta review that I read when I uh, started my position. I'm actually an assistant teaching professor at Iowa State University, so we take se teaching seriously. And I read this meta review about from cognitive scientists on lots of different strategies students use to learn. And they grouped them into sort of low utility. That doesn't mean that they don't work. It just means that they either don't work as well or they work for some students but not most students or they work in some subjects but they're not universally applicable. And a lot of the different strategies that are really common, they rated this after they reviewed the literature. So summarizing the material, highlighting, using a keyword mnemonic, imagery, uh, trying to sort of tie it to an image, rereading. Medium utility stuff was like, uh, so more useful, like explaining it to yourself. Interleaved practices when you sort of mix up. So you do math, then English, then chemistry, all mixing everything up. And uh, something called elaborative interrogation. But only two kind of things came, were rated as high utility, which again, doesn't mean that they're the best in all situations, but they're very broadly applicable to lots of different ages of students, lots of different subjects, lots of different people, okay? And the only two things that they rated this out of the 10 they studied were practice tests, which sort of is like obvious, but then also distributed practice. And, you know, so why does it work? Well, this is the sort of, sh this is the mental model I give my students, which is like, it's a way of kind of hacking your brain to make it think that uh, this stuff is important and I need to retain it. And I guess in some sense, it is important and they do need to retain it if they're going to do well in the class. But uh, it's based on this idea of these forgetting curves. So as time goes on, you forget more and more of what you've done. So if you've, uh, or of what you learned. So it falls off pretty steeply if you only hear this idea once and you're going to be very unlikely to remember it after a few days. But if you are asked to recall it again, your brain is kind of like, oh, this is a bit more important. This might come up again and you don't forget as quickly. After the second prompt, you know, it sticks around even longer and sort of it, you need to go longer and longer before uh, your brain lets go of this thing and so on. And, I, you know, I think of this as like, if I, I tell my students, if I gave you nine digits to memorize, you could probably do it and do it okay. If I asked you a day later, most of you wouldn't remember, but most people know like their social security number really well. And it's because it just keeps coming up and up over and over again. Even if you haven't been asked on a form since last year, you're likely to remember it. And so the idea behind spaced repetition, or at least the algorithm behind things like learn it fast, is to take this idea to try to develop a way to very efficiently study. So we wanna remind you of this topic and prompt you to remember it again. And we wanna do that in such a way that uh, you're not overdoing it and you're also, uh, so you're not constantly being reminded and sort of spending a lot of time studying every day. We wanna do it, we wanna get kind of the most bang for our buck. So suppose we say we want you to remember 90% of the stuff that we ask you about. And then the other 10%, you have to sort of relearn or remind or, or go back and see what you got wrong. And so if we're going to do that, then initially we have to remind you really quick, like maybe right after class. And you'll only recall a small, you know, you'll still remember 90% of it if we ask you really quickly. But then the next day we can afford to wait maybe a day before we remind you again. So initially, maybe we have to wait 15 minutes before you lose 10% of what you learned. But if you've been asked once, we can wait a day. Now maybe we can wait three days and you'll still remember 90% of the stuff. And if it's for, uh, the fourth time, maybe you can wait a month. And so there's this uh, group of people that really are into trying to figure out this optimal algorithm for this. And basically the, the gist of it is that 
you get a you have are prompted to remember something and like a flashcard if you get it right then you need a system to basically say all right uh how many times have i gotten this right and we're going to keep extending the interval before i see it again so the first time i do it i need to remember to review it again tomorrow the second time i need to remember to review this flashcard a week later if i get it right then then i need to remember to review it a month later it just keeps getting longer and longer and so this is the basic kind of intuitive idea of how it works and i'm an economist so if somebody out there is like a cognitive scientist and i'm explaining it really wrong please let me know and i'll try to correct how i tell things to my students but anyway you know if this is such a great system people use practice tests in their uh teaching but a distributed practice is used kind of at a uh is used by a lot of people in a sense of like things might come back and we might topics that we learned early in the semester might return but it's not usually done in like a very in kind of the rigorous optimized way that uh that people on the internet which is where i first learned this through i'll get to at the end uh are really into like trying to figure out what's the what's the most efficient way to do this and the reason is that like there's a number of challenges to using this it's sort of like exercising in the sense that to really get a big payoff you've got to review a little bit every day and instead of just cramming the night before the exam uh Second, the payoff can actually be really hard to see. And so I use this stuff myself when I try to remember papers. And a lot of, since 90% of the time, the little flashcard seems like you just know it and you're obvious. It sort of always feels like you're wasting your time because like, I already knew that, but you don't realize that if you let this thing go, you're gonna forget this stuff. And then the third and probably most important is that it's really hard to schedule this stuff. like at least before the, uh, back in the era when this would have all been flashcards with index cards and stuff. And there were systems involving sorting them into different boxes and marking them and so on, but it's, it's not easy to do. But now we have a lot of potential solutions to these problems. So to the fact that reviewing every day is like hard for people to do, it's, you know, take some discipline. The goal there is we wanna come up with a platform that makes this as frictionless and easy as possible to try to make it you know, as simple as we, or to try to make as little discipline as necessary required. In a course context, I think, I think that it might be easier for people to see how this pays off because they, can, they have a measure of how they're doing on exams and so they really know they need to know this stuff. And then technology, I think, is the big game changer where it's much easier. You can let a computer keep track of the scheduling for you instead of having to do it yourself. And so that brings us to this learn it fast platform, which is a way to sort of implement this for students. So let me tell you about that, all that um, out of the way. So this is learn it fast. It's a, uh, I don't remember how I first found out about this. I think I was kind of interested in this. Uh, I was like, I've always been looking for a way to build in this kind of stuff into my classes. And I had, started by uh, making like using a different program that's very popular called Anki, which is used for like uh, people in med school use it a lot to memorize facts ahead of their qualifiers. And so it's kind of like a flashcard program that uses these algorithms. And so I made it like extra credit if my students uh, used that and they could submit kind of a statistics thing about how often they used it, but there just wasn't much take up. Uh, and then last year, uh, I found out about this website, which basically lets you kind of intersperse this throughout a class. So let's log in. So the first thing to notice is that this is just free. It's all open. It's a program run by, a, I think, a team of two or three uh, open source kind of guys in Ukraine who I, I've emailed a lot with them because uh, I'm one of the few people who's using this pretty intensively. But so each student has an account which is free. It's just like an email sign up. And then uh, that's important because that way it can remember, it can kind of personalize the distributed practice for each of them. So I have my course, I teach Econ 301. And this is what students see. I think this is like, uh, essentially I create videos. They're each like, this one is nine minutes, so it's a bit longer, but they're usually under 10 minutes. And the, I just upload them to YouTube, make them publicly viewable. And uh, students watch this. 
And then they have a number of these kind of questions right after, which isn't that unusual. Like lots of people do asynchronous teaching with a quiz at the end of the lecture to make sure you're paying attention. Uh, so this is a math review section. So suppose I'm, you know, it's asking me about this exponent rule basically, and I show the answer and it's just self-assessed. Did I know it or not? And if I knew it, you can click, I was right. And otherwise I'm gonna, uh, I say I was wrong. And because I've created this sort of account, it's remembering what I said for each of these questions and kind of creating for me this review pile that is gonna, that it's gonna prompt me with every day. So, you know, maybe I was right about that. And I like that they're just self-assessed because you can then get kind of complicated questions where it's like explain the intuition and it can be very hard to uh, devise like a multiple choice or fill in the blank question like that. But if it's just self-assessed, like explain the intuition behind this concept. And then when they say show answer, there's an explanation they can say, I kind of, they can judge for themselves if they had that or not. And so anyway, this is, they do this, they go through all the things. So every kind of five to 10 minutes, they're getting these prompts. Okay. And so we've got in this unit, which is math review, we've got like uh, 16 of these questions that are like uh, kind of flashcard, really rapid memory based ones. I also have mixed in here just like longer, more complicated examples that they go through on their own and, um, and then they watch a video for. So this is what each, this is what a lecture, this kind of replaces a lecture for my online class. Then they go to this repeat section and the thing that's kind of cool is that those questions persist. It's not like you watch the lecture and then you take the quiz and you get your grade and then the quiz is gone until you want to review. Every day it's using this optimist, you know, the spaced repetition algorithm to try to come up with a set of things that it thinks I should review today. So here, what's the natural log of X? I, this is something that came up in an earlier unit, for example. And you can see here, if I, because I've reviewed this before, if I say I'm right, it's going to ask, it's going to hold this back for two days. So if I review every day, I'm not going to have to review this one tomorrow. Whereas if I say I missed it, then if it takes me five minutes to complete my review session, I'm going to come back to this before long. So maybe I'll say whoops on this case. Let's see if we have any that are longer. I don't think I've done this myself enough to, to get different answers. But the point is that as we progress through the course, students are going to start seeing stuff where, you know, if you say I was right, it's not going to, it's going to say one month. And so they're not going to see that question again for a, a month. And that's because they've repeatedly been prompted for it and have gotten it right in their judgment over and over and over again. So the students were really, they really liked this program uh, when they had to do it last semester. I was kind of, this was like a long-term plan to build this, but then COVID happened. And so I just jumped into it right away. Um, I had been building these questions for a long time and trying to create like use those Anki decks, the earlier iterations of this using spaced repetition. But this whole thing is free, open, like um, it's accessible to anyone. And what else is kind of interesting is that this program is actually designed not so much for educators, but the guys who created it were interested in creating a program for people who want to learn. And so the whole course can be, I'm in like user mode right now, not uh, edit mode, can just, you can just, they can copy the whole course. And then j that becomes just a template that now they can edit, add their own questions if they don't like what's in there. Um, or they can just create their own courses and use this as a simple note taking app and add questions uh, for their own learning and sort of to embedded in the note taking process. I don't know if any of my students use it that way because it was kind of crazy last semester and we're only a week or two into it this semester, but I want to see if I can log in to this using my uh, sort of where I own this course. Yep. So now this is what it looks like if I log in with my account that's like uh, the creator. And so you know, can see now I've got this edit button. And so I'll just show you kind of if you're interested what what editing looks like in this. And so if I want to create a course, you know, we can go to one of the ones that's not done yet. 
So I've got a bunch of questions here and you can see that now the question's there and the answer. And I've got all these little math equations because uh, I can just type in this like a normal thing, but they have a latex editor if you wanna do math stuff. Anyway, uh, and uh, you can do all sorts of, which is really useful for me as a economics professor. Uh, if you want to embed your YouTube video, you have the link here, so you can put anything in that's publicly available on YouTube, including lectures by other people that are like uh, openly available. You've got, uh, if you wanna host an image, this is a little bit complicated. They, they're just sort of like a, a skin. They don't have anywhere to host these images. They're just a place to put links and text. So if you want to add an image, you have to have an image somewhere else, uh, which isn't hard if you wanna borrow images from outside the web. Again, this is sort of designed as a note-taking app for students. But when I wanna upload like images of graphs and stuff, I have to, I have my own private website and I put stuff up there and then I use the link from that website. They've got, uh, if you wanna do like code blocks, which I've never really experimented with, it's not appropriate for what I need. And uh, yeah, bold and italic. That's, that's pretty much the set of what you've got. Uh, and then if you wanna add a question, you just click add new question. And inside these text, inside like the question and answer section is uh, all the same functionalities as before. So I could have my question, for example, have the answer be a YouTube video, although I don't know if that would be a, a good idea. I can use these latex editors, put images in, and I do frequently put images in. Let's see if I can find an example. Let's see. Um, I think I've got some images in here maybe. Maybe not. Anyway, sometimes my questions ask them to basically explain something about a figure. And yeah, here's an example. In the following diagram, you know, explain this or that, or in this case down here, I think I've got, you know, what area of this diagram is, uh, in this case, Pareto dominated is like the question. And then the answer is just a shaded in area. And they kind of have to mentally be like, did I know that or not? Anyway, so that's, that's the system. And it's like, uh, I think it's a really good substitute for delivering lecture. It's not a whole course in and of itself. Like, um, I don't think it substitutes for everything that courses do by any means, but I think it's really useful for lecture for a few reasons. Besides just the uh, asynchronous or like the optimization and memory stuff, my students sort of said that there's like three other things they really like about it. One is just the sort of standard thing where it checks their understanding. Like after they watch a video, they have lots of little short questions that sort of say, did you get what the point of that video was? Um, and I also think it's a useful as a way to motivate attention. So if you're in a classroom, you're surrounded by people who are paying attention. You can't, uh, if you go onto your phone or laptop or something, like there may be a bit of social pressure that the professor sees it or other people around you see what you're doing. And so you might feel a little bit more pressure to stay on the, stay focused on what's happening. And you might be afraid that you get, you'll get called on and sort of asked an easy question and not know how to answer. And so all of these like subtle things make it easier to pay attention when you're in person. And I think that this kind of system where you have lots of short, simple questions afterwards that are just really memory based, like there's not a lot of deep thinking and like um, understanding or not a lot of deep kind of calculation or anything to answer these. It's like, you should know it or you don't know it. And it's based on memory. And so, I think it's a useful check for them about whether, they, uh, whether they're paying attention, right? So a question could be as simple as like, what's this kind of price discrimination, what's this kind of price discrimination called where everyone pays a different price? And the answer is perfect price discrimination. And it's like, if you can't even get that right, it tells you that you're sort of wasting your time and you should go back, rewatch it and pay attention this time. And then also I think they said it's a, it kind of boosts their confidence that they feel like they didn't miss something, okay? So, like I said, 
it's primarily optimized around helping you memorize things. But, and so you do need to complement it with deeper things that are going to lead you to deeper understanding. Like, you know, so my class has all the standard stuff. Like it has a lab component, homework, projects, discussions, et cetera. But don't underrate memory is kind of one of my takeaways too from using this is like in economics, microeconomics, especially there's a lot of jargon. And if you don't, if you're not really comfortable with the jargon, then it's just harder to follow. And then everything kind of falls apart. So this is just one example of like a jargony question that to students, like getting the memory down on that is really, is really useful. And then also like you can experiment with kind of higher level things. So here's like a set of questions designed to try to give students uh, more intuition about a proof about that monopolies are going to charge higher than costs. Okay. So there's kind of multiple pieces to the proof and we break it down into all of these. And if you remember all those, then hopefully they can sort of see how all the pieces also flow together. At least that's the idea. So how I got into this was, um, I, like I said, I kind of found out about this. There's people on the internet who are really into this stuff. And let's see. Got a chat. Uh, I, I found out about this. Um, there was this website called Quantum Country that um, is, was my first exper experience with this. And it's just an all text website that tries to explain quantum mechanics using, uh, I see the question here. I'll answer in a quick minute. It is a, it's a document that has these kind of things embedded in it, like that learn it fast. And it, uh, it tries to teach you quantum mechanics or quantum computing, which is like a pretty big, a pretty heavy lift. And in my ex you know, I thought it actually worked very well. Like, so I experimented around with it. And so I got really excited about it and was looking for a way to do this myself and learn it fast is the first time I found a thing that lets you create your own documents. This was created by some pro like a team of a programmer and a, a physicist. And you know, there, this is what their iteration looks like. It's very beautiful. Uh, so you'll learn about qubits and you know, it's how many dimensions does the state space of a qubit have? You just read that it's two. And you can see down here, they have a lot of information about where you are in your review. You're going to be five days later two, one long term, And they've got these figures about so and so. So anyway, that was my uh, inspiration and in how I first learned about this stuff. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I got a question here, like, is it possible to have multiple responses besides correct or incorrect? Um, no, but the, uh, like, the, the people who run it have been very responsive to me, at least. So I think it would be happy to, like, I asked them to add this math editor, and they did. And I've asked them to do a few other things, and it's because they're very early. Uh, and so, like, I think the risk with this website is that it is... Uh, it is sort of like a, a new group. Like it's very new. These I'm like one of the first courses using it. I'm trying to, I want to tell people about it cause I think it's really cool, but um, they're very open to feedback from their users and like editing it uh, to suit their users best. Uh, but you know, there's always a risk that the whole thing will fall apart, which is why I'm happy that all the videos are on YouTube and like a list. And so it, for my purposes, uh, if, if that happens, like I've got all the stuff there and I also have all my questions uh, contained in like a different format too. So I, they have shown no signs of not wanting to be around and they're just free. They're not interested in like making uh making a big profit off of anything. They just want to, they really are enthusiasts about the, uh, the system and they just want to try to make it more uh, well known and, and used more. So anyway, uh, yeah, that's, that's my experience with that. Um, yeah. Uh, I was next going to talk about a different open source resource using the core econ project. Uh, but I don't know if, uh, if anyone has any quick questions about this learn it fast algorithm first. Okay, so someone's asking, can you export the content in bulk? Uh, I think so. I asked them about this at the outset, like, could I just download all my data and keep it as a back drive? And they sort of said, well, the code is all just freely available. So they seem to think, yes, I haven't tried it. Um, but again, like, they're very, they've been very accommodating working with me so far. Uh, 
uh, and I don't think you have to do it section by section because like the URL for the course is like just one thing. It's not like a different thing for each section. Uh, but again, I don't, I don't know a hundred percent. Any other quick questions on learn it fast? Otherwise we can come back to it at the end. All right. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm working on now. And that's for my uh, intermediate microeconomics class. I've also taught a principles of microeconomics course. And for that, I used a new online textbook called Core Econ, which is pretty cool. Um, I used it not because, or not exclusively because it was open and free, but because I really liked the textbook also. But the idea here was that uh, around after the financial crisis, there was sort of a, a move to rethink how principles of economics is taught and especially to have it incorporate more stuff from that seemed more directly applicable to the real world. So econ has long kind of has this reputation for being taught where like at the beginning you learn these very stylized uh, models that are heavily criticized as being unrealistic, like perfect competition and so on. Uh, and then over time you, uh, you advance to sort of the more realistic models, but a lot of people maybe don't get that far. Like, uh, and so there was a thing like maybe we need to have even the principles courses reflect where the, where the, you know, where things are actually going to go. And I think if you, you know, it, to be fair to the rest of the economics profession who doesn't use core or anything that, uh, everybody will claim that they, to they definitely try to give the sense to the, to the students that there's more to the life than the sort of perfect frictionless com perfect competition model. And all the books will have like chapters on imperfect markets and so on. But the framing is kind of like, even though they try to lean against it, it still sort of feels like the framing is there's perfect competition, which is since it's the first thing you learn, it's like the normal state of things. And then there's all the deviations. And so core econ was an attempt to rethink a lot of this stuff. And one thing they did is they start with these complicated real world, well, more realistic models. And then they try to introduce later the perfect competition as sort of this useful uh, approximation for some situations okay but anyway it's a program it's a project that was uh it's like donor funded and they've got a lot of different stuff here you can see on their site so a lot of different languages and it was originally developed the english version was originally developed in the uk there's just a free ebook uh which is what I assigned to my students. They can buy a paper book if they like that. And they, the cost I think was $50 when I did this a couple of years ago, but it might've gone down. And so, you know, we can see that they start with, they start with a lot of stuff about how the modern world began in the, around the industrial revolution. And there was kind of this big kink in history uh, or big change, big changes in a lot of these variables about like lifespan or, GDP per capita, they don't, they don't slowly change over time. They have this big kink. And then uh, they introduce sort of game theory at the beginning, social interactions. They talk about property and like how property rights kind of in a negotiation type game, they can affect how things eventually shake out. And then you can see we're only getting by like part six, we're introducing the firm, its customers, and then like, I think we start at the beginning, like the firm here is going to be monopolies and we're going to kind of start with the idea that there's one firm and its customers. And then later we'll add this idea that maybe there's lots of firms. And so I liked that approach. And so I, I adopted the textbook and it was just a bonus for me that it was like a free one. And they have some neat, because it's a sort of an online first textbook, they have a lot of, they take a lot of advantages of that, like um, the figures, are sort of dynamic and uh, evolve over time. So we've got, they kind of talk through inequality using this. And let's see, I don't know if I have a good example here, but there's videos where they interview economists embedded in it. And there's like multiple choice questions that students get uh, to sort of check their understanding. But unlike Learn It Fast, you know, they're not like persistent where they stick with you and you'll come back to them. So uh, yeah, like I used this in, it's now been a few years and I liked it. I thought it was, uh, I would use it again, but the big challenge was that um, 
principles of economics is, of course, hundreds of students have to take each semester and it can't just be taught by one person, it's taught by multiple faculty. And you really have this problem of coordination where if, if you try to take an approach that's really different than everybody else is taking, then it makes, it makes it harder for the department to provide resources for students to do well. Like uh, they have supplemental lectures available for classes, but they're gonna give the lectures, the supplemental lectures that are offered by TAs and sort of extra help is gonna be more geared towards what the majority of people are doing. And if the majority aren't using this new method, uh, like this new textbook, then I found I was like a little bit on the outside. Uh, so that was a bit of a challenge. And now like the econ department has gone even further in terms of standardizing uh, how econ 101 is taught to try to make sure that there's like a consistent experience throughout like uh, all the undergrad or throughout all the different instructors, which I think is a, you know, a good idea. Uh, but it means that you have to convince uh, the whole group to make this, to make the leap. And uh, it's always, it's always challenging to get people to, you know, uh, if people have been doing things one way, it's very low cost to keep doing it. Uh, and uh, like I said, I don't want to be unfair. I think that people do put a lot of effort into trying to convey, you know, the subtlety and richness. And it's not all about like, uh, you don't necessarily need this textbook to, to give that impression, but I really liked it. So yeah, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Um, and I thought I would, leave it there and take questions if, if there's any. Great, thank you, Matt. So thank you. If anybody has any questions, they can um, either unmute their mic and shut them out, or you can um, type them into the chat too. Um, in the meantime, I had a couple questions um, for you, Matt. So um, I was wondering if you were at all familiar with the OpenStax um, econ textbook? Yes, um, a little bit, and um, do you know if this kind of compares, um, the core textbook compares to that fairly well, or is it a completely different sort of? Well, it's, it's uh, different in the sense about sort of what they choose to cover. And uh, like, I think the OpenStax project is more like an open version of what a more traditional textbook would look like. And this is, it's not that, it's still the same economics, but it's the orders all shuffled around and the emphasis mm -hmm. and stuff. So I think that's, uh, that's the main difference between core and, and something like OpenStax. Sure, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And the standardization of course issue is one that we often run into at, at my university too. And when faculty are thinking about adopting an OER for you know, a, a course that has several sections and several professors and everything. And I was just wondering, do you think you'll make much headway within your department and have everybody sort of maybe adopt this textbook or, or do you think that's not in the cards? I think realistically it's not on the cards. They did move to like a, uh, they did move to a textbook provider that is, I think this is their first year they're experimenting with like, a, I think it's maybe Hawks or something that's like a lot less expensive than the traditional flagship ones, but not necessarily like uh, open, like, like those ones. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I don't know. I, I haven't been scheduled to teach. I'm not scheduled to teach it this year either. So okay. I've just sort of pushed, put it on the back burner. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Yep. All right. Well, seeing that we have no other questions, I might just ask a couple other ones about the Learn It Fast platform. Um, mm -hmm. So do you use this at all with face-to-face -face teaching or is it mostly just online? So what I actually did uh, before the COVID move is I was using that to park all of the questions. And at the beginning of each class, uh, so remember I said I was experimenting with ways to try to get students to do this kind of spaced repetition stuff. And um, I couldn't, they weren't really doing it. If I asked an extra credit to do it for extra credit, it was only a handful. And since it's all self-assessed, I never really wanted to make it too formal, like graded, because I don't want, I want them, them to be self-motivated to do it and not just to like say like, yeah, I did it. Uh, because I don't really know they could just you can just click through at lightning speed and if, if all I'm doing is sort of tracking your usage so what I did last semester is at the beginning of each class I gave them five minutes to uh, to basically review their stack of cards and I would sort of you see that all of mine are numbered so I could say add questions x through y uh, to your review pile 
And then I would use that time to walk around the class and distribute, like hand back the homework or hand back tests or hand out homework. I just tried to come up with some excuse so that I was circulating around the class and like handing stuff back, but it didn't look like, so that there was this sort of subtle pressure that he sees what I'm looking at. And so they don't want, but I'm not also like uh, being a, like, I want, like I'm trying to create this self this yeah. idea that they're doing it on their own. And so I th they really liked that. I asked them like, uh, should we keep doing this? And I did a survey and, you know, 80% of them thought it was great and that we should keep doing that. So that's, I think that is, it is a useful way to, to organize sort of a spaced repetition system in a face-to-face -face class. You have to tell them all to bring a laptop, but they can also do it on a mobile device or something like that. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That's a very, it, it seems like a really sort of innovative thing you're doing with that. Um, one thing as I'm working with OER projects, um, one thing we always like to think about when somebody does something really interesting or has a resource that seems particularly helpful is how do you get that resource in the hands of other people who might be interested in using it? And so you had mentioned that you could export, um, you know, the content, but would this be something that you could upload into an OER repository, like something like OER Commons or some other sort of common shared space for other professors or students could could find it and use it? I don't know. I um, I haven't done anything with like the downloading of the whole website or anything or archiving it. I should probably do that. In, uh, but like, I'm just still like rushing to try to put it up before because like, uh, it's not totally done. And I'm like a couple weeks ahead of the students in terms of recording the lectures. But um, like, you could certainly add at a minimum, like the links or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. you know. Great. Or, yeah. All right. Well, does anybody else have any other questions? Well, hearing none, um, if anybody does, I'm, you know, uh, feel free. I, I'm kind of speaking on Matt's behalf, but I'm sure, you know, I'll feel yeah. free to contact him directly if, um, if you have questions. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. And, and once again, we are recording this, so I'll post it on our YouTube channel and you can always come back and, and review the webinar or share it with colleagues or anybody else who you think would, would benefit. Uh, thank you so much, Matt, for um, your presentation today. It was incredibly informative and I think it gave folks some, some good thinking points on how they might um, you know, sort of explore similar um, platforms in their own teaching. Yeah, definitely email me if, uh, if you have any questions or concerns but it's pretty self-explanatory and you can just go ahead and go. And as soon as you create an account, you'll get an email probably from Arcady, who's the creator of the thing. So. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Um, I will end the recording now, but if, but yeah, if anybody has any questions, just let Matt or I know, and uh, hopefully everybody will tune in for our webinar next month. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Have a good week and month, everybody. Bye.